Would you please put your hands together and welcome to the lectern, Kath Newell. Thank you. Ooh, so, hello. hello. I am Catherine Newell and I'm talking about positive communication or, you know, successful communication. Uh, I've been communicating for just over 50 years now and uh, you know, I'm pretty good at it, it's not bad, but uh, from time to time there are absolutely furious rows and uh, awful faux pas. And so um, I became more and more interested in communicating how we communicate, especially when I became a mother and it became particularly pertinent to me as a mum, particularly because I'll explain uh, later why, but how I was communicating and what I was communicating. And then also I became a shadow work coach and I work with people one-to-one -one and couples and in groups. Um, and so it became even more important that I really understood how to listen properly, how to communicate well, and how to support people uh, to listen and communicate with one another. So this talk is in three parts, and it's things that I have found really curious or interesting and helpful to me. And obviously I hope that you may too. So this is for you. Um, so the first part, is about saying what we do want. My girlfriend said she wanted nothing for Christmas. Sadly, I thought that's what she meant. <laughs> and it's a, a really simple thing. And so, so when I first became a mum, obviously I was reading a gazillion books about how to be perfect, mother. And uh, the chapter I still remember is this little chapter in which it was pointing out that we talk to our children in negatives. We talk in negatives so much and that it's particularly unhelpful to these newborn people um, that have just arrived. And so I, uh, the, the, the principle was really simple. You know, don't go on about what you don't want, say what you do. And so I started to try and do this and I found it really, really difficult. So I'd go into the bathroom and the kids would chuck water everywhere. And of course I want to go, what the blazers is going on here? Or words to that effect. Uh, and, and start berating and, and being cross. And so there I was trying to go, okay, let's shift this. Uh, let's keep the water in the bath, uh, which really is counterintuitive and sounds really silly. Um, but I was, I was attempting to, to try and make this shift. Um, and then it became even more clear that with my youngest, uh, who's still at 14, does not speak, um, that it became really important that I understood how to speak to him. His, his language is very limited, but he does understand. And so I understood from this that actually to be saying stop running was, was really unhelpful. He's got to understand the word stop and running. I'm talking about what I don't want. And so I was taught to be saying his name, Axel, to get his attention, and to say walking, what I do want. It seems simple, doesn't it? Stop saying what you don't, say what you do. But I found it really tricky. I then started observing how actually this uh, turned up all, in all sorts of places in my life. Um, I'd say, you know, to my daughter, you know, don't leave your wet swimming stuff on the bed. Uh, and there it is on the floor. Uh, this, uh, this woman I heard about, she was uh, very upset. Her, her husband was uh, working all the time, uh, starting to work in the evenings, starting to uh, eke into the weekends. And so she was again sort of berating and moaning, you know, you're working too much, you need to, you need to cut down. So you can imagine her delight when he came home and said, I've taken the weekend off. I'm going golfing with the lads. So, so this whole part one is about trying to really observe how we go on about what we don't want and try to think about what we do want. It was at this time that I came across a research report uh, which basically said that the British are great at saying what they don't want. And these researchers went over Britain across houses and families of different race and class. They had clickers for negative comments and positive comments and they found they were clicking away, clicking away. It was 19 negative to one positive. So the, the waiting there is we are a real bunch of whingers and moaners. We're just constantly going on about what we don't want. And this, this as well is true. So do not read the next sentence. Yeah, the fact is we are, you know, like anything, it's like a muscle, you're exercising it. You keep going on about something, you're far more likely to have that happen. So, you know, do it differently. So then I started to look at, you know, why, why do we do this? Why do we go on about what we don't want and don't say what we do? And what I came to realize, so when I was working with people in these one-to-ones, one of my first questions is, what do you want to have happen here? 
And actually a lot of people, again, they start that counselling session with moaning and berating and saying, well, you know, it's ridiculous and, you know, how horrible everyone is and how, how it's all everyone else's fault. And yeah, I keep bringing them back, so what do you want? And so a lot of people, I get that we're so, so trying to think about what we don't want and blame and shame and be across that we don't seem to spend an awful lot of time sitting and thinking, what am I passionate about? What do I love? And uh, so that just isn't very clear for a lot of people. The other thing that I've really come to notice that is even if we do know what we want, we are loath to tell our loved ones. And so we have these scenarios where I work with couples and he goes, well, you know, what do you want? Goes, well, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you should know what I love if you love me. <laughs> and so yeah, that's conspiracy. I'm, I'm not, you know, if I did know, I'm not telling you. And, uh, and I'm like, what, what's that? What are we doing? This is crazy. And then I realized that it's because it makes us vulnerable to say something. It seems much easier and more comfortable to carry on berating and challenging and going on at, rather than to say, well, actually, what I want is. Because then we're in that vulnerable territory of they might say, well, I don't want it. I'm not going to give you that. I'm going to reject your proposal. So, you know, for me to say something like, you know, I would really like a bunch of fresh flowers once a month. You know, I'm putting it out there, exactly what I want in a time frame. Is it going to happen or not? <laughs> but you know, really, believe you me, it's more, far more likely to happen if we can actually say it and, and put it out there. And, and to be patient and to be willing, it might be a dandelion picked from the neighbour's garden, not quite the sort of 12 red roses you had in mind. But you know, to be patient with, it may happen at some point in some way. And what I've also noticed, this vulnerability is really common in our English language. Uh, I used to have a lot of foreign language students uh, in my house, and they were constantly asking me, how do I translate this? I can't translate how you speak, because we work, we work with a lot of negatives, which I wasn't even aware of. And so we'll say, I don't suppose you want to make me a cup of tea. <laughs> so if they say no, I go, yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> Right? But even, you know, it's, it's a nice day, isn't it? Is it not a nice day? It might not be, actually. I wasn't sure. Glad I asked. You know, so we, all these isn'ts and doesn'ts and wasn'ts, it's weird. Uh, so there's a lot of anxiety in the way we speak. We don't seem to like to ask for things, and we don't like to state things, and we just diminish everything. So the invitation in part one is to say what you do want, simple as it may seem. So, part two is appreciations. Walking home from the pub, the policeman said, Madam, you're staggering. To which I replied, and you, sir, have a very nice smile. <laughs> uh, being told you're appreciated is one of the simplest, yet most incredible things you can ever hear. And it's so cheap. So again, I work with uh, couples, and when I first meet my first couple, I might want to just sort of check out how they are with their communication with one another. And this is a sweet little exercise that you can do with your loved ones, where you kick off with saying, you know, something you love about your friend, your partner, your child. And so what I love about you is, and then they have to repeat it back. And you can actually see it's amazing how people don't really listen. And even with things like appreciations, which we so crave, <coughs> Uh, we don't really listen properly. And then the deepening of that is the second one is, uh, and the reason I love this is because, and that's often really beautiful. Often the, the partner has no idea that that is why they like that thing. And so it's, it's a very lovely thing to not just say, I like it, but I like it because. And I can obviously start assessing how well they're listening and how well they're feeding back, because my God, if it's hard enough to hear a compliment, uh, how hard is it to hear it when it's, it's a stickier situation? Very important when you're giving compliments that you don't stick a barb in there and say something like, I really love it that you finally put the rubbish out. <laughs> you know, that's a barb. It's not a, a nice thing. And this is a really sweet thing to do with couples, with warring siblings. It can be really helpful. Siblings that are fighting a lot and hurting each other to get them to actually start working on their skills of finding things to be uh, liking about each other, and classrooms and so on. Also to check your ability to receive compliments. And this is something else, I see people, you know, so, so person one says, you know, I really love this about you, they go, oh, that's nothing. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, yeah, you've got one too, or whatever. We, we diminish, we sort of try and push it away. 
uh, or, or ridiculous, we, we just say, oh yes, I like your shirt too, uh, or I like your hair, or whatever, and they're bald. You know, it, it's a stupid thing uh, we do <laughs> to reflect or try and diminish. Anyway, so, so this is all about uh, appreciating. And I've actually made it my daily practice to appreciate things. So if I see something, I go, oh, wow, that's really nice. Stop, think about it, say it, communicate it, gift it. My God, the world is full enough of uh, stabbings and atrocities and horrors in the paper. And so I've sort of taken it upon myself to, to try and spread a little joy and, and happiness. And also, it's a selfish act anyway, because it's actually super good for me. And so from Buddhism to uh, neurologists, they've discovered that the very act of thinking about things to be grateful for and appreciative of sets off all sorts of little synapses and lots of little serotonin and oxytocin gets kicked off in your body and you feel great. And then not only do you feel great, but as you gift that to the other person, poof, off they go and they feel great too. So... I'm standing in the station, woman in front of me, she's got a beautiful outfit on, and I just said, I really love your outfit. It's just full of color and whatever. I felt really happy just looking at it. And she turned around and she said, oh, thank you so much, rushed off, got her ticket and came back. And she said, you know what? I'm going to a really difficult meeting just now and you've made my day. Thank you so much for saying. And so just that, whatever it is, it's good for you. It's good for them. There's something also very important about making it personal. So you don't just say, what a great painting, uh, what a great meal. You say, I really liked it. I really liked it and I really liked it because. So, for example, you could say, I loved your talk. <laughs> and it's really helpful to explain why, just for an example. Uh, anyway, so point two, spread a little joy and happiness in the world and tell people why you like them. Brilliant. Okay, this is three. So, great. Positives, negatives, spreading a little joy. Part three is about when things do go awry, when shit hits the fan. What do we do? You know, when that toothpaste has been uh, squeezed wrongly too many times, the loose seat is dirty again. Well, you know, I've been looking at this and I, I tried this for starters. Put your laundry away or I'll punch you in the face, <laughs> love mum. <laughs> Felt really good and really made me laugh a lot, but I uh, don't really recommend doing that. I've also really tried this one. I'm not arguing, I'm explaining why I'm correct. <laughs> Some people just don't get it, do they? <laughs> really. Um, but anyway, I tried all of these. And I really wasn't getting anywhere. You know, I'm, I, I grew up, I don't know about you, but I grew up in the I'm not smelly, you're smelly uh, school of arguing. And uh, <laughs> it doesn't really work, does it? <laughs> it's like a, a mud fight of nastiness uh, that gets worse and worse. And so, you know, the thing you're trying to resolve and explain why they're miserable, why you're brilliant, and they just need to change their behavior and please you so your universe is uh, back on track. It, it, it doesn't work because they seem to think that they're right as well. So I then uh, happened upon this. Uh, so this is uh, Marshall Rosenberg's Nonviolent Communication and I think he's a wonderful man. Sadly he passed away a year or two ago um, and he will say himself that it's quite a wooden thing to go through but it is effective and I haven't come across anything better. So in this, he very clearly and cleanly points out how to clear, how to communicate when things are tricky. And basically the whole gist of it is stop pointing the finger at the other person and saying, da -da 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 -da, the problem with you is that, uh, but actually talk about yourself. Bring, bring it back to yourself, which like so many of the other things is a really vulnerable thing to do. But anyway, um, I have a couple of clients uh, and they've allowed me to talk about them. Um, so, so these are my clients and uh, they're having a few problems uh, in their relationship. <laughs> so uh, Ken and Barbie, they met, uh, they found that they were really cut of the same cloth, came from a similar mould. <laughs> but uh, despite this, they were experiencing uh, some real problems in their relationship. And so uh, they basically, they basically came to me and uh, wanted to talk through the issue. So basically what was going wrong was Barbie is usually brilliantly on time, if not probably early. Man, Ken is unbelievably late. He is so late. He, he misses planes and he, he doesn't make it to the theatre on time. All that kind of stuff. 
So uh, Barbie wants to have a word. Right? So the first part of the clearing model is make sure your partner is in a place to hear you. So obviously if Ken is about to dash out to the door to go to rugby or crystal healing lessons, or whatever it is, um, he's not in a place to listen. So the first point is to check your partner is in a place to hear you. I love this. My girlfriend wanted to have a conversation about me being too childish, but she didn't know the password to get in. And can you see his little face there? I love that. I couldn't talk for half an hour looking at that. Um, anyway, so make sure Ken is in a good place to listen. And so once, uh, once you've got Ken there, uh, the, the important thing is to start with what's called data. So again, it's not about your opinion, it's not about what you think about the situation, it is just purely the data of the circumstance. So in this, uh, Barbie brings up that um, they had agreed by text to meet at eight o'clock. At eight o'clock, she was below the big clock at Waterloo Station waiting for Ken. Ken did not turn up till half past eight by the big clock. Data unarguable. If you can't agree your data, the clearing's probably not going to work, but you've got to stick with data uh, and, and this unarguable truth. The next thing that uh, Bobby has to do is talk about her feelings and say how she felt when Ken arrived half an hour late. And again, you have to be very careful with uh, the feelings you say, so you can say that you're angry or sad or upset, glad or happy, although I don't know why you'd be clearing, but you have to make sure again that you keep away from words that are judging. So if I said, I was really let down. So this is saying that there's a, you're, you're a let down basically, or I'm disappointed, you're, you're disappointing. So you stick to a very clean feeling. So saying, I'm very upset and angry. Point four is about the story I tell myself. So when you were late and you didn't turn up and I felt angry and upset, the story I'm telling myself. And again, this is a really helpful phrase because what it's saying is that this is my story, you have another story. They're, they're none of that's the truth, it's how we are impacted by certain things. So everyone could go to the same party, five people have five different stories. So this is just her story. So she says, the story I tell myself, and again, don't point the finger talking about herself. And she says, you know, I just felt like uh, I'm not worthy of respect. I'm not worth being on time for. And what's underneath that, which is really difficult to communicate, is basically I don't feel lovable. So Barbie shares this uh, with Ken. Point five is the impact on the relationship. She says, basically, I don't want to meet you. You know, I've liked meeting you, I've enjoyed hanging out, but I don't want to meet you. Every time I meet you, we end up rowing because you're late and I want, to, I want to finish it. And so six is uh, what you want, knowing that you may not get it. You need to make sure that it's a request, not a threat. And so she says, you know, basically, I want you to, to meet me at the time we've agreed. So it's heavy, isn't it? It's a bit wooden, but it works. And uh, so, you know, Ken, bless him, he's listened to this from Barbie, and uh, he feels really crestfallen and really upset. And so Ken then tells Barbie about the fact that uh, whenever he was late, his dad would take the belt to him. And so Ken, you know, really had a bad relationship with being late and being early. And since his dad had passed, he was so enjoying being late as a big fuck you to his dad. And so he was late for everything. But he really understood that this was really impacting his life badly. His boss was going to sack him. He, he couldn't make it to planes. And now Barbie's threatening uh, to call it a day. So he says, you know, OK, I'm going to really you know, step up and uh, try and turn up on time for, for myself as a grown up. And then Barbie shares her story and she grew up in a care home. And uh, she used to wait in the reception area for her dad to turn up uh, on those very rare occasions. And she'd be sitting there with the clock ticking and the receptionist looking meaningfully at her. And invariably, he did not come. And she would take her little bag with her makeup and so on. And she would go back to her room, heartbroken for the father that never came. Very cheerful, isn't it? I seem to ace cheerful talks. Anyway, you will be really glad to know that they are happy. So look at that. So Barbie has learned to ask for what she wants. She's got her, looks like 20 pink roses there. So she's asking for what she wants. And of course she appreciates Ken on a daily basis for turning up on time because she feels loved and respected. And of course, every time they have a glitch in their relationship, they use the clearing model. So that's 
that, but thank you for listening, and that's my happy ending. Um, the most terrifying foe in the world is someone who's mastered everything you've just spoken about and manages to use it as an offensive weapon. <laughs> how, how do you deal with the, I hear what you're saying, kind of bastards? Yeah, I've been accused of that. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> I love that place. Um, well, well oh, actually, I mean, you're, I really hear you actually, and you're right, so... <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and the truth of it is that if I have been really smart and I have really twisted it and I have really been successful, actually I haven't been. It's a rotten win, yeah? And I've actually, I've crushed that person. And if I'm really clever, that's not what this is all about, yeah? So I've actually failed. If you're, if you're utilizing your, your skillful wordsmithery to that effect, then actually you're not that smart, are you? Guilty. <laughs> Yes. Um, can I first say I really enjoyed your talk? <laughs> and the specific Why? reason I enjoyed your talk <laughs> <Right. laughs> <Love it. laughs> is that you just admitted that it could all go wrong and these weapons, can, these things can be used as weapons. Yeah. Do you think there is a value in communication to silence? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes the best thing to say is nothing. For sure. Why is that? I'll do it now. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes somebody is offloading and somebody is needing to be heard. And so really, anything, we have we've nothing to say to that, you know, unless they're specifically looking for feedback or response. Sometimes, you know, you, know, you just want to be really mad and angry. And actually the most powerful thing you can do is just meet that person there. Just stand and be with them, yeah? It can be really hard to say nothing. Yeah, yeah, really. You know, the but no, no, you're wrong. That's what I'm talking about, the mud slings. And sometimes, it, it, so you know the uh, triangles, so you've got adult, parent, child. So sometimes, you know, if your parent or your, or your friend or your loved one has dropped into child and are having a shit fit, the best thing we can do is stand there and, and be with them and let that happen and let that all sort of tumble out like an emotional vomit. Yeah. Uh, the worst thing that happens, and guilty of it, is that I get into my child and I go, you're smelly as well, and then off we go, and then you've got two children just having a horrible, horrible time. And that's often when all the worst things are said that you can't put back on. Yeah. So yeah, try and shut up and let that roll, let that vomit go, don't join in the vomit. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was just interested in you saying about your kids yeah. and that I know some of this it feels like almost like learning to drive you know that it's so I was, I was trying to remember you were saying the first you do this then the second then the third then the fourth and by the time you got to fifth I forgot what the first one was and I'm thinking how would you do that but do you think if you are using that with your kids that they will then use it without thinking about it like will it just yeah. be normal communication do you know what I mean have you seen that with your kids then has that been a one of them's here. <laughs> She's amazing. Uh, yeah, she probably sounds, well, she is. She's very emotionally intelligent. She's very good at expressing herself. And it's kind of the environment we've, we're kind of talking in and, and growing up in. And sometimes it's really nice to, to what we call hike out and like not do any of that stuff. I mean, the, this model that I showed is something that, uh, you know, I'm in a lot of groups, both groups that I'm in and groups that I run and basically if people are getting charges with each other then the, the group isn't safe and you have to clear those charges between two people and this is the model that just keeps turning up everywhere I go and you know apparently Gandhi used it well organizations use it uh, warring couples you know it's a, it's a very very well worn it you know comes in different versions of it but it's basically that and yes, it takes a, it, it, it is surprisingly complicated. Marshall writes it so simply, you read it, you go, yeah, I got that. And then you try and do it. And, and all too easily you start going, you know, well, the problem with you is obviously, and then you're just trying to explain why you're wrong. Uh, and it, it takes a lot to keep, keep it in, talk about me, don't talk about them. Um, so it is actually, it's, it's hard work, it's, it's difficult. 
but if you do master it, it, it makes life a lot sweeter and easier. You know, this, this Barbie and Ken thing could have easily been, you know, uh, you're always, you don't give a shit about anyone else. And then he goes, you're really uptight and you're just, you need to relax, you know, and it could have just been a row. And that's something I'm very familiar with in my life. This is an opportunity for, you know, being in that awkward place of sharing who you really are and, and hoping that the other person gives the monkeys and will sort of go, okay, I get why that's really important. And given I care and love about you, for you, I will change the way I am. So the previous model didn't work for me. The latter one, I agree, can be really, well, you know, it is problematic and I'm trying to work out a more subtle way of doing it and go, when you're in time, I feel really loved. I don't know, there must be a, a, a sweeter, shorter way of doing all of that, but I haven't worked out yet, so. I think that's wrap it up there. Can you put your hands together, please, for Catherine?